If my street pleasure to welcome you to this um uh, which I have seen for the first time and uh seems very welcoming. So I hope we will have an opportunity to cooperate with uh, Roda in the future, if not far from the institute uh, in which I work and which is for organizing uh, this event. So, um the institute full name is International Development and International Relations. And we uh, are happy to be partner to Osservatorio Balkani Caucaso uh, in uh, organizing this event, especially that I see my good, good friend and longtime friend, Luisa. Um, and, and then also to meet um, other colleagues and all of you as, as the audience and also the participants of this um, today's event. Um, Luisa will say a little bit more about the project itself. I don't have an opportunity to say more during our panel, so I pass my word to you now. Thank you. It's another thank you all for being here. Thank you uh, to the co-organizer and the rest of the partners for hosting us. Uh, it's really a, a great opportunity to, to have this um, seminar, which is part of a um, Germany network called Trapoco, uh, which in Italian is a strange name, it means um, in about a few times, um, uh, shortly after. So. Um, but uh, Trapoco is also transnational political mobilization. Uh, the idea has been to study for a few years in, in a network of a few um, universities um, in Italy and abroad, starting from Scuola Normale Superiore in Florence, by uh, reaching um, Vienna, um, CDU in, um, um, sorry, in um, Dublin and Belgrade as well. Um, and luckily um, uh, here too. Uh, so our idea has been to discuss about transnational political mobilization uh, with the idea that um, there, is, there is a shifting of, com of conflict um, at transnational level, but also of mobilizations and on civic initiatives. And um, for us, this seminar is an important step because not only we discuss about contestation and conflict, but also solidarity uh, in a situation of uh, contestation. Um, which is normally uh, not really a fancy topic to um, the, the, the academia uh, uh, researches very often. Somehow we prefer to study war than, uh, than uh, peace or solidarity. And um, I'm very, very happy to discuss this with a very rich panel of uh, um, participants. So um, in my research experience, as I said, uh, uh, solidarity is not studied enough and there is not enough in general dialogue between different um, academic fields, but in particular with academia, with uh, activists uh, and um, civil society organization. And I think the more we discuss together, the more um, we can speed up this um, uh, creation of alternative views of um, our political spaces. Um, I think I could have a lot of things to say, but I don't want to uh, take the floor and I have some concluding remarks uh, and therefore I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. Um, and now it is really my pleasure to uh, announce this extremely competent panel. Uh, and uh, I have to uh, say that actually having in mind that we basically uh, organize this panel as part of so many other activities. Emina uh, and Rosella are, um, in terms of operational and logistical issues, extremely uh, um, responsible or and and, and um, um, I could use I could probably say at the end the uh, words of gratefulness for your uh, investment of time and uh, uh, energy in organizing this panel, but I really am uh, impressed that we have all of you and Chiara uh, on the other side speaking about this topic. Um, when looking at the program, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to learn a lot because for recently, uh, if we, or at least in my work, uh, the issue of migration has concentrated mostly on 
challenges of integration of migrants who remain in Croatia. Croatia, as we will probably hear, is still a transit country. People, local population is leaving and um, migrants are just passing. And the small number who are staying here uh, have also had challenges of, of being um, fully accepted and integrated. But the issue of borders and contestation of borders, of passages, of events that are happening uh, on these paths and solidarity that you mentioned in terms of our knowledge, but also our action is something that I think we need to know more and learn about. Uh, so I will probably make, uh, and I will listen carefully to what uh, our panelists have to share, but I hope you will also join us in the discussion that will follow. Um, we have a slight change in the order of presentations, and I will invite Emina Pozinti, who I'm happy to announce is now part of the institute that I presented and the co-organizer of this uh, event, but whom you probably know from her different lives and roles uh, before, um, is going to uh, share with us her research and the topic of her presentation is urgencies and emergencies of the Trans-Balkan Tribunal for Justice, so in transnational and translocal migration justice movement. Thanks so much, Sonala. Um, I am really honored, really honored to be here today um, in conversation with um, the inspiring activists and journalists, researchers, artists. Um, I should speak up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today in conversations with people who have been inspiring my work for a long time, activists and researchers, journalists, artists sitting here, really all longstanding comrades. Um, so meaningfully engaged in the in the labor of my, migration and migrant justice world making. Um, I come into this talk today, as Sanhaba said, as, as a new IRMO researcher, uh, but also as an activist and a writer interwoven in the fabrics um, of the collectives Transbalkans Solidarnost, um, agitate unsettling knowledges, and IPSRC which stands for Imagining Transnational Solidarities Research Circle, um, all, all dedicated to what ITSRC elaborates as a labor of deepening our understanding of violence against refugees, immigrants, and communities of color, and recognizing our own complicities and responsibilities in relation to it, and helping to create just future for those whose humanity is undermined by laws and sentiments that justify such violence. The transnational solidarities in the Balkans, migration justice world making, seeks to imagine and continue solidarity movement building with the migrants and refugees subjected to racial denigration, xenophobic refusals and, and rejection along the Balkan route and at the EU borders. The, the discussion amongst activists um, and comrades from Italy, Croatia, Slovenia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina stems from the struggles counteract, counteracting deadly politics of the EU border and migration regimes. And so in this conversation, we're going to dive into the critical interrogation of our own capacities and energies in solidarity movement building while rethinking the questions of ethics, politics, methods, aesthetics, and impact of solidarity movement and border abolition. And so I'm starting off this panel um, slightly also using my notes uh, because I'm gonna be um, introducing you to a, a very sensitive text, a text that came through the months and months of collaboration between activists and comrades in the, in the Balkans um, who have started forming the Trans-Balkan Tribunal for Justice Initiative some years ago. And, um, and with this work, with, with reading of this manifesto, we are trying to see collaborators and move on the discussions and, and really establish active movement building with the individuals and collectives translocally and transnationally. So I will start off by reading the ground day for the Trans-Balkan uh, Tribunal Justice for Justice Initiative and would like to invite you later to engage in the discussion and provide critical interrogation of this idea 
of the idea that was tested many times globally, um, but also the idea that needs more than being an idea. It needs more of a concrete action uh, from all of us. So the Trans Balkan Justice Tribunal is an alternative transnational uh, tribunal established in collaboration with border crossers, people of color, activists, journalists, artists, scholars, intellectuals and groups, collectives and organizations that reject the normalization of the oppressive structural violence against people on the move and destruction of land, while simultaneously imagining the political communities that live in solidarities and justice. The tribunal engages in imagining and continual making of transnational solidarities while seeking for epistemic, political, and environmental justice for subordinated peoples and injured landscapes, both ongoingly exposed to damage, devastation, and dispossession. The Trans Balkan Tribunal for Justice is grounded in a commitment to the mission of ending the militarization of the borders and spaces of the Balkans and all forms of repression stemming from racial, ethnic, gender, and other social and cultural hierarchies. The tribunal is an autonomous political structure built by the collective efforts of witnesses and subjects of coercive and dehumanizing politics that mark, criminalize, discriminate, beat, steal, imprison, expel, and erase refugees, migrants, people on the move, people captured on the move, undocumented people, people of color, and those targeted by the politics of criminalization of solidarity. At the same time, the tribunal is an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the historical continuities of the current migratory securitization regimes in the Balkans dictated by the European politics of border control, derogation of the international protection and anti-migrant violence, while also rooted in the politics of surveillance, expulsion and erasure from the 1990s and wars that irreversibly affected people and post yugoslav landscapes. Till the day affected by mine explosions and active weaponry, natural disasters such as floods and earthquakes, as well as the serious degradation of the habitats and life of humans and non-humans. The vision and practice of the Trans-Balkan Tribunal for Justice emerges from three critical points. The first embraces political clarity and sharpened disapproval of continuous, unsanctioned, and systemic violence, which finds its justification in the protection of borders, territories, national and cultural heritage, and the like. We strongly oppose the oppression performed by the systems of domestic and international institutions, which narrows and abrogates freedom of movement, freedom of expression and organization, and the right to safety. The second point is an open practice of sharing, listening to, and documenting the experiences and narratives of subjects, participants, and witnesses of repression, including the land, that simultaneously seeks restoration and provides counterpoint to dominant discourses perpetuating disenfranchisement. This point also provides for a stronghold to leave and abandon the position of the weakened and hopeless and to transform into the position of actors who redefine justice and solidarity through collective action of resistance and the imagination of alternative world making. The third critical point considers carefully thought out and interwoven collective collaborative practices, practices that nurture interpersonal relationships, equality, and trust as political tools of transformation, transformation as well as the sacredness of interdependence between human and non-human species. Such praxis breaks isolation, social and interspecies distance and separate them from one another. We envision the, the Trans Balkan tra Justice Tribunal as an endeavor with continuity that recognizes the sensitivity and the rigidity of the social, political, and environmental context and counters oppression by making interpretations in polyphony, multi perspectivity, and creative yeah. expressions. 
So building the tribunal as a strong counter narrative and counter politics to the dominant political discourses and practices of illegalization and criminalization of human existences, as well as environmental degradation, we independently define the criteria and methodologies of work, guided by collective energies, demands for healing, and praxis of collaboration, the harmonization manifested in the natural world. By combining formats from performative forms of seeking, seeking justice, through sharing stories of losses <clears throat> and struggles through public trials of perpetrators of violence and oppressors and rejuvenation of injured environments, we build new ways of searching for epistemic and social justice and strengthen visibility with existing forms of struggle. We see the tribunal as a process, time, and space for further politicization, organization, and mobilization of solidarity and freedom for all. So each of the examples that we're going to hear that are going to be presented today engage in this alternative world making and envision migration justice as a project on the move while localizing, translocalizing, and transnationalizing struggles for solidarity and in solidarity. Such meaning making and practice making nourish hope as a political modality in the realities actively stealing hope and breath. In that sense, not only that grassroots movements reoccur and connect, but they build viable third world solutions that can and have been through various, various examples of people's tribunals globally, impact and change international spectrum of law and rights. So this manifesto is a reflection and at the same time an offering for further conversations and movement building. And this is where I'll stop and open this floor for the others. Uh, thank you, Nina, uh, very much. I hope you will have uh, questions afterwards, but can I just ask you who is me? Trans Balkan uh, Tribunal for Justice Initiative. Yeah. Uh, I know a collective, that. yes, a collective that we formed a couple of years ago through Trans Balkanska Solidarność, um, a regional collective that emerged in 2020 um, when people on the move were confined actually in um refugee camps um, and detention centers uh were not uh permitted to use water or soap or um, have medical treatments during uh during the worst scenarios of covid covid19 um, epidemic or pandemic um and tens of thousands of people were stuck in the balkans were not able to move were not able to look for safety and for health safety too and so we emerged as a collective who fought for for the rights um, um for the rights of migrants at the time uh, we have also had long-standing collaborations before. So Trans Balkans Solidarnos was sort of a newly formed collective after maybe a decade, decades of collaboration between different collectives and struggles in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. And it's open, I assume, for uh, new membership. I think we're in the share the same yeah. goals and ways. I think this panel and multiple other conversations that are going to occur this summer are sort of an opening for those conversations and that movement building. So I think it's a, it's sort of a reopening for us as mm -hmm. well after a long pause that we had uh, when it comes to conversations on formation of this tribunal. Excellent. Okay, we may have a chance to continue on this, but I will invite now Chiara Milan from Scuola Normale Superiore da Firenze, who Conduct, who has conducted research and will uh, share uh, with us some of her insight. And the topic of her presentation is grassroots European solidarity along the Balkan route. Solidarity at the borders. Chiara, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here for the great introduction. What I will present today is the result of a research that has been conducted actually together with uh, Luisa from Osservatorio Balcani in Caucaso. And uh, so part from Luisa, part uh, by myself in Scuola Normale Superiore. And uh, I think the findings are worth uh, being disclosed because they are particularly interesting. So um, as uh, Luisa said, we are involved in this project, Transnational Political Contention in Europe. And in the framework of this project, we devoted our attention to explore um, grassroots solidarity movements 
in particular, this part of uh, civil society actors from Italy, in our case, who engaged uh, in helping supporting migrants in the 90s and in the 2020 in the region. So, uh, and how they, they framed the idea of uh, European solidarity. It's interesting because we investigated these, uh, those groups uh, that uh, from below try to intervene. In the case of the 90s, uh, they intervened to, with the idea of supporting uh, uh, internal uh, refugees and also people who were escaping from the war. And in the 2020, they, those groups, they engaged in the same region, so the Western Balkans, to support people on the move, so crossing the Western Balkans. And those groups were shared several uh, issues in common. The first is the geographical proximity with the region. We are talking about groups, uh, uh, heterogeneous groups, uh, who uh, like uh, travel, for instance, during the weekend or during the summer, um, but frequently to the region to provide uh, first-hand uh, support uh, to migrants and to um, internal, uh, internally displaced persons. Uh, but we're also talking to a, of a group of actors uh, who are very heterogeneous in terms of political background. In fact, in Italy, um, in the 90s, the most different groups mobilized to provide solidarity with uh, those affected by wars. Um, for instance, they, they were the part of the Catholic Church, but we saw also the members of political parties or simple citizens who just decided to, to travel to Bosnia in the case or to Croatia, to the refugee centers, to provide support to people. In the 2020, uh, other groups of uh, volunteers uh, moved there and they were also, they share an heterogeneous background, so to say. And the third, uh, third uh, issue they have in common, those groups uh, mobilizing in the 90s and in the 2020s, is not only the geographical proximity with the region, the political fragmentation and heterogeneity of uh, their background, but also the fact that they, they strove to replace uh, uh, the institutions. As in both cases, they deemed that uh, the European Union, the their, their state, their institutions were not committed enough to, in the first case, to stop the war. And in the second case, the most recent, to provide uh, a decent uh, uh, support to people trying to, um, to people on the move along the, the migratory route. Um, the background, as we said, is heterogeneous, as well as it is the, um, the context uh, in, which, uh, in which they act. Uh, for instance, in the 90s, the solidarity with um, people affected by war was quite uh, shared by in Italy, but all over Europe. So there was a certain need of supporting people affected by war. While in the 2020, that was not the case, or at least at the beginning of the so-called refugee crisis that we prefer to call a reception crisis, uh, there was a certain um, uh, widespread um, agreement that th there was a need to support people on the move, but we saw that uh, throughout time, the atmosphere changed. Uh, the borders became closed and uh, the criminalization against uh, um, uh, civil society actors begin, began. And uh, even nowadays, it is difficult from those, for those groups to provide support to people on the move because over time it was prevented to um, uh, international actors, to grassroots actors, even to distribute food, clothes, um, or basic uh, items to, to the people on the move along the Western Balkan route. So those, uh, those groups share some similarities, they have some differences, but uh, I think the most interesting finding we, that emerged from our research is the, the way they perceive uh, the European Union and the European uh, uh, project in general. So in both cases, uh, those persons, because we interview the uh, people belonging to those groups, so-called activists, but we can call them more generically solidarians, since not all of them consider themselves as activists. So, um, some people just say they mobilized because they felt the need being citizens to support people in need. So all those persons share this idea of being European citizens, of mobilizing in support of their European peers in the 90s, but also in the 2020s to support uh, um, also the local population who was, was still helping people on the move in the Western Balkans, 
because they're part of the same European space and having the same uh, European roots. What differs is the um, amount of hope <laughs> they, they have towards, uh, towards the European project. In the 90s, uh, the idea of the European Union, I mean, it was right after the Maastricht Treaty, was still a European Union that would, uh, a project that would, uh, um, that was a, an idea also of a project that would help to stop the war in former Yugoslavia, that would intervene. And uh, this idea of the, of the European Union as an actor able, or at least uh, hopefully willing to stop a war and to support people, um, people on the ground, people affected by the war. So the idea there was still, the, those groups retained some hope in the European project. In the 2020, that was not the case anymore because uh, the, Grassroots groups just uh, are not only eurocritical, so they criticize um, the role of the European Commission, for instance, and the role of certain European institutions. They retain some hope in the European Parliament. Uh, they have some contacts also with the members of the European Parliament who are supportive, but they don't believe anymore that the European Union is the actor able to, um, to intervene and to provide a solution, quite the contrary. They don't, uh, they don't uh, have any hope. And that's why also they, they intervene because they want to replace uh, the unexistent, what they consider the unexistent European solidarity. So instead of, uh, uh, they, they don't frame it as a European solidarity, the attempts of the European Union to, um, to solve the migratory issue because they don't deem the European Union able to solve it and not even willing to do it. So they somehow want to replace the institution and call themselves as a, a doing a grassroots European solidarity. So from European citizens to other citizens. And I think this was the most interesting um, issue we found out because we saw of course how over time also the European integration process changed, even uh, the, perspectives of a section of new countries changed the role of Croatia in this case that entered the Schengen zone changed in those years and uh, and from below there is no hope at least from those mobilizing to support people in the move and facilitate their passage uh, to the borders there is no hope that the European Union will be able to intervene not even to provide a solution to to the issue or to the migratory issue um, so the, the vision nowadays is of disenchantment, no hope, not only criticism, but a certain skepticism towards uh, the European Union and its institutions. And I would say that uh, uh, this research was conducted a few years ago, but we can claim that with the development uh, of the, um, uh, with the migratory pact uh, of the EU, I mean, it not, uh, we, we don't expect it to, be, to have changed in the last years. And I would conclude here, but of course, uh, I mean, um, hoping to receive comments and also if Luisa wants to add something on the research, I just wanted to summarize some of our findings that we found particularly uh, interesting. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chiara. I think for us, it's especially, how shall I say, uh, interesting and uh, close. Uh, so hard to, to have this comparison of the 90s and then the, uh, 2020. In the span of 30 years, a lot has happened. Uh, and what strikes me is this uh, um, conclusion uh, observation that you make, uh, and that is the grassroots actors, maybe in the 90s, acted in hope that the EU will act along the same goals or they share the same goals as the as the uh, European Union or at least believed in the EU institutions and now it's the active opposition or it's a replacement of this institution and they see it in at the national level in EU member states but now also at pan-European level so I think this is something that really uh, has to be uh, taken from your presentation uh, home and understand that we have huge polarization within uh, within the EU and on many issues, migration being probably the strongest one. In the 90s, the EU was a different actor. It was a different organization. 
And I would say that the enlargement also brought countries who are very uh, migration, um, um, well, not necessarily rejected, but very, very uh, uh, reserved towards um, having uh, more migratory influx. And that is something that now the EU has to do deal internally. So it will, and then it's not able to do externally, obviously. Uh, so we we are left in this, uh, especially in this region, with uh, with uh, policies that are not reflecting probably the internal discussions in member states and voice of those who want to see uh, more humane and more uh, uh, better regulated and and uh, migration which respects human rights and probably also the economic needs of Europe are not are not heard. Um, I hope you will have questions also or comments from from others uh, also our panelists. Uh, I invite you to comment to each other's uh, presentations but uh, uh, again this was very interesting at least to me to hear uh, this competitive work spanning 30 years. Um, we moved to something not that far uh, different, but probably from a different perspective to Nijara Ahmetajevic, who is a human rights activist um, and uh, who is um, fearless, I would say, in posting and sharing information of uh, violence and abuse against uh, uh, migrants and, and refugees um, in um, our region. It is also not surprising that this is a female panel. I <laughs> would think that this is like a gender equality panel. Uh, but when it comes to these issues, it's also often women who, who are very strong voices and very powerful voices in uh, confronting um, uh, prejudice and um, and then the, the official narrative um, that that we share. The Nijara will. Her topic is, she will probably say a lot more than the title of the presentation is, but the title is Solidarity in Bridges, Everyday Labor of Border Abolition. Thank you, uh, Senada, and thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, I, will, um, I do not have academic kind of like uh, insight into all this, a point of view. Uh, we'll talk as a somebody who, uh, as an activist, is present uh, in different countries uh, for already a couple of years, following migration uh, routes to, um, toward uh, Western Europe or European Union, and um, collaborating or trying to collaborate with different uh, solidarities and groups uh, from Turkey um, up to different European Union uh, countries, but also as somebody who is um, asking, uh, I'm asking myself for all these years. Uh, what solidarity is and uh, how we can understand and how we can um, approach and how we can uh, and should we uh, change the meaning or do we understand the meaning of the word solidarity and also as somebody <clears throat> who is um, often faced with the, the, the questions uh, when I hear the European Union leaders talking about solidarity between the states mm -hmm. um, I'm often very confused um, is it the same solidarity that we are talking about, or does it take a meaning from what what we uh, we are doing or, or um, talking about? I, uh, I, I want to, to talk about solidarity through um, through examples, to put it in that uh, way. I will talk about some of the, the uh, ideas and some of the initiatives uh, I have been part of or observed uh, over the years. Starting with uh, one that I find uh, very important when we talk about uh, response of the people uh, who are the migrations in Europe, uh, recent migrations in Europe, uh, which was born actually here uh, in Croatia. It exists uh, until today, it's changed a lot, and it's uh, IO Sirius. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that IO Sirius uh, really developed and uh, was created as a like response to many, many of you were probably part of it. Uh, to shocking situation uh, in 2015, uh, where numbers of people were uh, going to uh, Balkan countries uh, from Greece up to North Macedonia, uh, Serbia, uh, coming to Croatia. Uh, back then, uh, at least for a very short time, uh, for one year at least, 
the, the, the borders were um, kind of uh, open, whatever that means in these administrative terms, uh, and people were passing through the countries uh, fast, some people. A uh, group of people here in Zagreb, uh, I believe, uh, first uh, responded to this, what is happening, coming out and like offering like a real help. But the part that I took a part uh, of uh, is an uh, info team and something we call Digest, which is also kind of like a solidarity um, answer to the crisis, if I can call it like that of a lack of information and lack of uh, knowledge uh, for a people uh, about what is really happening. Um, so uh, we noticed that uh, even though there are a number of people present in the field, being those who are on the move or those who are trying to help or to answer in different ways, the people do not know, do not have enough information about what is happening in different parts uh, of the Balkan. And that's how uh, Daily Digest uh, started. First, it was only, uh, we only, uh, we're making like a short posts uh, on Are You Serious Facebook uh, page. Uh, then we were updating them uh, during the day. And these short posts are be were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger with more and more information. Uh, and uh, as the, the network uh, of Solidarians uh, who would really do this uh, were, was enlarging, at the same time, uh, the, 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 the number of information that we shared was uh, becoming uh, bigger. So uh, soon we decided uh, not to do it only on Facebook, but to start um, a, a new letter of, of this digest uh, that we uh, started sharing um, on different uh, platforms, uh, in the first place Medium, but also uh, other. And we uh, manage, uh, when I say we, it's a group of people uh, from real different uh, countries and backgrounds. Uh, we, at some point, had people um, in Turkey, in Lebanon, uh, all over Greece, like every single island in Greece had somebody from uh, Are You Serious? Being from Are You Serious, we were not a formal group, we were just like, people who came together with other people to do something together. Uh, and so becoming part of it meant you sent a message on Facebook and saying, listen, I want to join you and share something with you. Um, so we had people all over Greece, um, all over the Balkans, I think every country in the Balkans, uh, in different countries of European uh, Union, and uh, we were just sharing, sharing information. There were times, uh, it was especially 2016 and 2017, when daily image uh, of a Facebook uh, page of IO series without any advertisement, uh, no money, we were all doing that just out of solidarity, we didn't even ask for anything, we managed to reach more than 600,000 people, wow. which is a lot. Uh, and it's impressive. And I have to say, I've worked for different media, that is really, really crazy, and that's, that's really amazing. Uh, we were so active and so uh, in possession of so, so much information, we had to set the rules along the way to check information that we are getting from the people uh, on the ground to see how to do it. But also we were spending a lot of time in discussing one with each other about the language we can use. Mm -hmm. How to call people that we are meeting, how to describe things that we are seeing, what kind of pictures to put, what not to put, mm -hmm. what to say, what not to say. So we used to do on one daily digest took us like hours and hours, sometimes literally all night. And we used to publish it in seven or eight o'clock in the morning after lots and lots of negotiations among all of us in order to, to be accurate as much as it is possible, uh, to, to, to be uh, sensitive uh, to what is happening and to provide as much information as we can. Uh, so at some point, we also had people in all of the islands who were participating, all of us who were in the field, we were also being part of like very active kind of like a, a different solidarity uh, activities being, including also uh, offering like uh, different types of help, like direct help to people. Um, so uh, we were sending people from the islands were sending to us uh, numbers of people they met today on that day coming out uh, on, from the boats and uh, the arriving. Uh, so we used to count this uh, whole night. Um, and at some point UNHCR said that we have a better number than they do. So mm -hmm. that's how, and Guardian and many mainstream media were quoting actually, are you serious when they were talking about 
all this. Uh, nevertheless, with the time, um, this daily digest was changing a lot, which is normal and it should be this information, it's a platform for information. Um, at some point, it still exists. Um, it is still more or less based uh, on the work of volunteer of people volunteer uh, to do that. Uh, but with the time, uh, less and less uh, people uh, are following. I think now it's really very, very small uh, number, uh, which is interesting. And it, it became also uh, much harder to collect information for different reasons, uh, but also to fight with them. To, to compete uh, with the media, uh, especially mainstream media, but also with the big organizations involving UN, ILM, or even like organi NGOs uh, who are in the field that were not that really anymore and who do not understand how important share of information is in solidarity and for solidarity or whatever we are trying uh, to do on the field. So the, the form is changing, and for me, it's also interesting that this this question um, of uh, how it is changing and, and, and why it is important and why why this kind of of, of work uh, is changing uh, over the time. The second, um, it, for me, interesting uh, to observe and to be part of uh, the point that I want to mention is what was happening in Athens uh, from 2016 until probably. 2020. Now it's different, it still exists, but it's uh, much different. And that's even before in 2015 and 14. And that's direct um, action from the local solidarians and internationals who came to join uh, to uh, local people who in Athens uh, decided at some point when, two, when so many people were in the city uh, without accommodation, uh, local solidarians uh, uh, decided to occupy uh, some spaces and to create spaces where people uh, will be uh, given accommodation, but also different services, including uh, food, including education, um, including um, like assistance, legal assistance, uh, or just um, kindergartens and these type uh, of activities. Uh, I was part of the, the group called uh, CORA. Uh, we used to uh, have a big center in the center of Athens, uh, in an area called Exarchia, uh, where uh, we used to have um, really, really, really whole road of activities. And what was interesting and what was important for us that everything we decided to do, we decided uh, in assemblies where we were meeting and talking, uh, but not only of uh, in assemblies were present uh, being internet people, international solidarians who were coming to Athens, uh, local uh, people, as well as the miners. So together, we decided on what we're going to do and how we're going to do that. Literally, we were deciding together about what will be for the lunch or breakfast day after. Uh, and it was important that we are doing in that. It is, it is very difficult. I learned like that, how difficult it is <laughs> to function in this kind of like how many conflicts we have, understandings, misunderstandings, uh, but it's interesting also the way how people interact, the friendships that develop, the relationship that develop in, in this. Um, it was different because uh, back then I, I started having contacts with international volunteers and NGOs, and it was totally different approach. Like if you get in touch with NGOs or like the, the international group of volunteers, they will always like try to tell you like about power relationships, about this or that, or rules or how you should talk or not to talk to people. In these kind of like places, it was different. It was people to people, and we decide on the rules and we decide on what we what we're gonna do. However, uh, over the years, also for Quora, uh, more and more problems uh, were kind of like interacting or like were there as a barriers uh, for, for the idea to, and not only for Quora, but also for other like City Plaza, uh, like Notara and many other uh, places like this. Uh, and one of the big problems is that in order to keep going with these kind of ideas and, 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 and approaches, uh, you do need money, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to get it if you don't want to formalize your existence and to become an NGO, which this, this approach is very against and it doesn't fit together. And also people who get in, 
part we become part of these kind of 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 of, of uh, activity solidarity uh, kind of like based things uh, do not do mostly believe that being an NGO and making a project around out of migration uh, is a part of the border regime is a part of externalization and keeping borders alive. And then, of course, you reach the point when you say, okay, if I don't do that, I cannot keep on doing this. It's very difficult. And you all go out of all that and leave it to somebody else who is ready to engage in that point. And you look for another ways to continue searching for the meaning of what solidarity is. For me, after this many years of being in the field in different countries, uh, the best example and closest to what I believe solidarity is or what I imagine solidarity could be, uh, is the answer that I see that um, just ordinary people uh, are doing to this what is, or showing to this what is happening around us. And I could see that in Greece, um, in uh, Kosovo, when I was in Kosovo, in Bosnia a lot, um, in Croatia, uh, in, now I came from Poland, uh, I, I saw that even there, in Italy, everywhere. And uh, talking from, I will just quote from Bosnian example, but it's very similar in all of these countries. Uh, many of these people who engage in these activities avoid have contact with big organizations, with NGOs, and they just do it what they do, like people to people. They don't promise anything. They don't. It's really very basic, very human contacts. I will give you what I have. Being a hug or being a food or being a shoe, then I will wish you a lot and I will understand what is happening and why you are in this position and where I am. Also. They don't talk about our relationship because there is no power because it's human, very open and very sincere. It has many difficulties. Uh, it is often uh, ignored or or kind of like even suppressed, if I can say, by NGOs, by big organizations, by the state. Police do not like people when they're engaging in such an honest in, and, and, and like really human kind of like interactions. But uh, from my experience, I think that's the only thing that works. And also I think that's the only thing we need. And I think actually that's the only way to fight what we really want to fight, and that's closed borders and the system of borders, system of securitization. Uh, because like migration is not a project, <clears throat> and we should not look at it as such. Uh, it's not an issue for NGO, it's not an issue for big organizations. It's an issue that we have to find the answer. What do we want? Oh, I want to abolish borders. I want the world in, the, in which we will all be free and equal, and where we will have the same rights, including the right to dream and to hope. And for me, the only honest way to, to, to achieve this is through the solidarity. And being part of the, these kinds of activities, uh, participating in this uh, fight against the borders and, 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 and the system that we are living in, after all the experience I have, um, it really comes to this human contact, me to you, and up to uh, two of us or a group of us, we are fighting together for something we believe. Uh, and that's something that I would really like that we talk about today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was very inspiring, um, uh, especially the example that, that you uh, gave. Um, now that you said uh, how people do, uh, if I have two minutes to tell a story of my mother, who is 80 plus, and in Tuzla in Bosnia Herzegovina, in a bus station, there were migrants, and she it was called, it was last, uh, well, two weeks ago, and she drove her car from our little place to Tuzla with some blankets and, and stuff, uh, and she parked uh, close to the bus stop, and she called people, so they came and took it, and um, she said goodbye, and after she was sitting in, um, going back into her car, when the policeman appeared to tell her that she parked irregularly, although it's empty area, and he find her, <laughs> and he looked, 
all the time. Uh, but then when, when uh, she finished, um, she had to pay for time for parking for five minutes uh, improperly. Um, so I think we, we have, uh, I mean, he didn't have to do it, but obviously uh, there is some sense that this is not something that is supported that you shouldn't do. And he was, he was sending a message. But um, after all your different experiences, um, I'm actually struck by the trust you have in human potential and human solidarity uh, on a person to person, like that, as you said. Yeah, as a survivor of Bosnian War, I have said, still believing that, you know, we learned the lesson. <laughs> and maybe we didn't, I don't know, but the only thing that I can, that keeps me going is to have trust. Very nice. I think also you, there is a lot to um, analyze the know-how of these organizations or, or different initiatives. And uh, I think it would be at some point, if you have time or collaborate with others who had the same similar experience, I think the know-how of how these uh, initiatives function would be also uh, relevant to many others who will face similar situations and will try something similar. So knowledge sharing is also encouraged. And now certainly uh, not the last, and I'm very happy to um, um, present or uh, invite Mr. Lipovets Chevron from the University of Ljubljana, um, our neighbor uh, to um, say more uh, about intercultural mediation as a bridge. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all of you uh, for being here. I think it's very important that we discuss all these topics. Uh, thank you to Nijara for this inspiring talk and thank you, Emina, for inviting me. Um, yes, I, I think that besides, uh, as you said, ordinary people who are um, making a lot of solidarity gestures uh, in the Balkan, so-called Balkan route, um, there are also people as, as we know that are coming maybe from Italy to do volunteering uh, and don't have a migration background. But at the same time, I would like to right now talk about a group that is almost invisible, group of people who uh, are refugees themselves or they have migrants background and they are very important for the, for the support for people who are um, in so-called Balkan uh, migration route, but also inside our countries. These are uh, intercultural mediators. And this is um, just to refresh your mind. I, I uh, memory, I know that you know about this, but just to know, I, I, was, I was studying quite a lot uh, different um, definitions about who is intercultural mediator. And there is just uh, some, some, some of my, uh, some information also mainly for those who are online. Um, they're, of course, they're mostly of migrant background. They, of course, speak at least two languages uh, and have excellent knowledge, uh, at least about two countries, uh, countries or societies or uh, cultures. And usually they are uh, described as a bridge. It's a bridge between two words, between, for example, employees and in public services, teachers, doctors, and others and migrants uh, or minority groups. And of course, usually uh, people who are in this field, they, said, said, they say they, they're facilitating communication in everyday uh, migrant relation. And of course they help in this sense to overcome language, cultural, legal, and many bureaucratic barriers um, to their right. Now, see, uh, grazie. Now we can no 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 uh, uh, so we can say uh, that this is quite a new professional and uh, has been present in last decades over Europe. Uh, I could I could say that mostly in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, um, also Belgium. Belgium is really important because in Belgium uh, you can. Um, when you enter Belgian hospitals, you usually uh, have intercultural mediators uh, helping you, but uh, and they have been there for almost 30 years. 
Uh, but also uh, for me and for all of our colleagues in Slovenia, what's very important, Italian experience. And in this sense, it's a huge solidarity from, from Italian uh, friends, uh, such as uh, Gavon and other people from Trieste and Emilia Romagna, who were showing uh, to us what is happening in some Italian hospitals, in, in some Italian health centers, uh, and also in schools. So, uh, for example, just to tell you that in Emilia Romagna, you have a hospital where uh, you have intercultural mediators who are covering 200 languages. 200 languages. For 200 me, what amazing. Languages. 200 languages. And um, if you go through Europe, you could see, you can see that Europe doesn't have a, a clear um, answer to uh, huge barriers that migrants and refugees are encountering uh, at every step of their journey and every uh, step of their, uh, you know, every day. So, um, but in a way, intercultural mediation is uh, is a way of approaching this, this field and has various names, not only intercultural mediators, but also language and culture mediators, inter or culture mediators or cultural brokers. Um, it's very important to, understand that there is a huge difference differences there are many differences and also many similarities uh, between intercultural mediators and interpreters or community interpreters uh, because usually that i'm generalizing now but we can discuss further on uh, language interpreting is only one of the tasks uh, performed by intercultural mediators not not the only as in case of many, many times in case of inter, interpret, uh, interpreters. Um, anyway, so you can see here, I don't know if you know, you see from, from here, where, uh, but there is a ladder model. I think is the best way of um, understanding what kind of tasks these intercultural mediators are, are, are having, are covering. Um, First is, uh, is linguistic interpreting. This is, of course, accurate and full transmission of oral messages between public employees, for example, and foreign speaking people. Then is facilitation. Facilitation is covering resolving misunderstandings, cultural brokerage, helping the, for example, employees as doctors or as school teachers uh, and the foreign speaking persons to take up their respective roles not to be completely lost in them. And advocacy, at the end, advocacy is very important and it's not uh, something that is not part of uh, intercultural mediation as uh, some people uh, would think. Uh, it's quite important to understand that, it, uh, as you can see there, visibility and also control is growing from, uh, for example, uh, less visible role, of linguistic linguistic interpreting to more and more visible role and more and more control over um, communication are having those uh, are having intercultural mediators that are, for example, doing advocacy. Um, if I just quickly jump on our experiences in Slovenia, um, in the last decade, I think also in Croatia, also in Bosnia. Uh, we were witnessing um, many people who were engaged as, we could say them, uh, to, to them that they are in the cultural mediators, but uh, usually they, are, they were not um, recognized as such. They didn't have any role, institutionalized role, but they were working all the time uh, in very bad conditions, without any uh, institutional support, without uh, any, any training without knowing the um, standards of their work. So they, are main they were many times uh, used and misused. And uh, since we were, um, when we were uh, discovering this field, we were trying to do something that was meaningful and uh, a group of anthropologists uh, was, was engaged in this, this uh, process. In a way, we, um, collaborated uh, in different projects of National Institute of Public Health in Slovenia. Uh, and uh, we tried to persuade this institute to uh, 
employ intercultural mediators in different institutions. Um, in a way, we succeed, but partially. Uh, 12 intercultural mediators were officially employed in 11 healthcare centers in Slovenia. They were um, employed mostly for uh, Albanian Slovenian combination, Arab uh, Slovenian combination, and Farsi Slovenian combination. And now, um, after this uh, quite a big su success of their work, uh, many kindergartens and schools are also very interested in, in, in employing, employing this, these people. Uh, later on, uh, we succeed uh, that with with a that was a huge struggle to uh, officially recognize uh, this profile as a national education qualification in Slovenia, and now more than forty people got qualification, and um, in the same time, in uh, practically in parallel manner, we were trying to uh, organize uh, training courses. These training courses were usually. 40 uh, years uh, hours uh, um, long and were organized once per year and were of course free of charge and were completely um, um, self-organized. We were, we were trying to do our best, uh, just a group of people from different uh, professions. And the most important uh, lecture here was that we never tried to um, teach them from vertical manner, but from horizontal manner. And you can see that there in this picture, if you can see something, uh, we are there with um, some of um, experienced uh, intercultural mediators. They were also uh, co-educator and mentors. So it was very important for us to always involve them. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, I think it's, it was quite important um, in all this process of collaborating uh, with intercultural mediators in Slovenia and organizing this uh, training, but at the same time, we were also uh, doing a collective research with them. Um, we understood that uh, in many cases, people who are coming to our country uh, are in a way, um, they could always or usually do unqualified jobs. They cannot, they cannot uh, uh, you know, have jobs that they were educated for. And uh, intercultural mediation is one, just one uh, of the possibility um, to, um, that their intellectual skills, their knowledge is recognized. At the same time, it was very important for us to understand that many women, who were completely subordinate in their societies, in their communities, uh, had the possibility to emancipate. Uh, and they have, um, in, a in a way, with this, in this new profession, with this independent role, they have the possibility to overcome the role of victim. Uh, at the same time, they were incredibly um, eager and they succeed to um, self-organize themselves. Uh, they establish uh, a networks between themselves, and in, in a way, in this way, this network is really helping them in many, in many ways. At the same time, as you as you know, they have this crucial role in public institutions and, of course, in migrant communities. Now, just to to, in a way, um, explain to you better their, their role. I have two examples, but I don't know if uh, I'm not too long. No, uh, please okay. share that. Uh, if you can uh, go forward, uh, the first example. I can, you can maybe some of you you can read, but I will, I need to read because I think it's uh, uh, unreadable from from this perspective. Uh, so uh, this is a, an example of um, intercultural mediator who we could say that is trying to resolve cultural misunderstanding. And I will quote: I first saw this woman on the Slovenian border. She was a refugee and uh, had her three and a half year old child in a bag who weighed only three kilos. The child could not talk or walk. And the only thing he was eating was his mother's milk. As an intercultural mediator, I followed them for several years until he started to, to walk, talk and, and eat normally. You can imagine the satisfaction. I went with his mother to the hospital for every single checkup where I interpreted 
uh, what the doctor was asking and what the mother was answering. One day, the doctor called me and said, the mother doesn't know how to feed her child. I asked the doctor if he had tried to find out why the mother has this problem. He answered, I told her that she must tell a fairy tale to the child while she's feeding him, but she's incapable of doing this since she has not imag no imagination. I knew about her traumatic past experiences and I explained to her slowly, step by step, how to sing a song or tell a simple fairy tale to her child. The fact is that she did not know what a fairy tale was since she had never been told one. So I asked the doctor, how can you say that she lacks of, of imagination? What do you know about her and her past? She doesn't know what a fairy tale is and you cannot expect her to be able to tell one. So this was, for example, of how she intervened and she really changed the perspective of this doctor. And the second is um, a shorter one. Uh, is I think this could be uh, called or named as, a, as advocacy. And I will read, I will quote. Another experience uh, in perpetual mediation in her 40s, 40s reported having argued with gynecology. She, the gynecologist, asked me if the patient was clean. I, respond, I responded that she, the patient, does not, some, uh, does not come from a different planet. But she went on and told me to tell her, the patient to cut her nails. And I said, what do nails have to do with the gynecological checkup? After having been exposed um, to discriminatory conduct on numerous occasions, this uh, intercultural mediator decided to write down everything that was said in front of the healthcare professionals. The intercultural mediator concludes, well, uh, note taking was a change, uh, has changed the attitudes of many healthcare professionals. So she invented this way of how to um, address uh, this racist and discriminatory conduct. And uh, to conclude, um, uh, intercultural mediator as a bridge, I, I put a question mark also before. Uh, I don't believe this metaphor is correct because uh, usually um, the bridge assumes two sides that are uh, equally accessible and hold equal power. But in practice, we can see that this is quite uh, idealized and simplified metaphor, uh, since cannot describe this really complex role of intercultural mediator. And um, we can see in, in their daily practice that they have huge problems with loyalties. Um, maybe you can uh, recall many experiences in the Balkan route, uh, how many times intercultural mediators are employed by the police, by Ministry of Interior. So uh, they are in a way made and used or misused by, by authorities. And uh, I know the case is that they need to spy for the police on people on the move move and they were informing police about uh about their 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 past lives and so on and many times also they were asked to select among asylum seekers who needs to have protection and who not so this is uh, a hard these are horrible examples um and i believe this is usually when i talk to this kind this uh, intercultural mediators usually uh, um this was due to this completely subordinate uh, status, subordinated status of, 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 the, uh, of intercultural mediators uh, and lack of training and lack of understanding of professional standards. So at the same time, we could say that um, they are really, in many cases, in very precarious uh, situation, but at the same time, um, in the institutions or also in, in, in our communities, usually people don't understand their role. So uh, for example, in asylum center in Ljubljana, we know of many experiences, many, many, many situations when they were asked 
for example, an Arab speaking uh, intercultural mediator was asked to uh, um, interpret uh, for Farsi speaking uh, person. So, and he did this. He did this, and he, knowing that he would, he would really uh, uh, he would do it really in a wrong manner. Uh, so. There are also many other uh, dilemmas. For example, in many occasions, I could say that I witnessed how um, there is a huge lack of professional boundaries. Uh, intercultural mediators uh, need to give uh, psychological support. Uh, they were health coordinators. They were taxi drivers. So, in this sense, they were since didn't they. Since they didn't have a very clear status inside the institution or also outside the institution, they were not able to protect themselves. Um, so one of our colleagues um, said that much better metaphor than uh, a bridge is a crossfire or a punching bag. She said, I quote, I sometimes feel like a punching bag. Uh, they all punch you, employees, clients. And you have to accept it. You have to have strength and energy to endure. So uh, to conclude, um, this profile is carrying the weight of responding to needs which remain systemically unaddressed. unaddressed. And intercultural mediators, of course, for the, themselves cannot fix numerous barriers in, in, in health, in, in education, uh, in administrative units. Um, and of course, they cannot be uh, the, the corrective or accessory in increasingly racist Europe. But uh, if we um, give enough support, enough training, enough supervision, enough, uh, if their role is recognized, they have permanent employment or uh, also independent financing, uh, they can be a really important element of solidarity in our society. Thank you very much. So this was really, really um, informative and I think very important. Um, and uh, I have really so many questions, uh, which I don't want to uh, monopolize this, um, uh, the fact that I'm chairing this panel, but uh, I mean, do you see, uh, you said that the degree is recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, Curriculum that no, it's, uh, the national qualification is recognized in Slovenia, but this was a huge battle, and we uh, we have this national uh, um, educational qualification is something that you receive after a test after after having um, yes yeah, like it's even like it could be an oral exam could be um, you know you can have different exams. But um, the problem here is that this should be that you should get this kind of uh, qualification only after training. But we have a training that is not connected to national qualification. So we are doing these trainings, um, you know, in, in a parallel sense. But yes, I think they are very interested in, in, in getting qualifications and in also in getting training. And for uh, preparing of the training program, did you cooperate with some other countries or uh, they already have this? Yes, we, we have this huge uh, help from Italy and from Belgium. Okay. And we also translated uh, these um, standards of intercultural mediations from, from um, Belgium example. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the authors uh, of the standards were, are our collaborators. So we are trying to get as, as much information and as much sure. experience uh, from Europe as possible. Maybe Croatia can learn from Slovenia then. We can all learn from each step. other, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much for to Chiara who is uh, online and to our three panelists sitting here. I open now the floor to any of your comments, questions. Questions. So, 
In the meantime, can I ask you whether this exchange with Italy and Belgium was done in the framework of some kind of European no. project? Was it? Um... We were doing everything is a kind of uh, grassroots because we were so in a, in a way we first uh, in the first phase we uh, collaborated with National Institute of Public Health, and in this sense we tried to put. Uh, into cultural media inside healthcare, uh, healthcare sector. This was the most difficult step. But once they were inside and the healthcare sector said, yes, this was a, a moment of change, but <laughs> they thought that this is the end. And we knew that it's just the beginning. beginning. So um, in the, in, in, from this moment on, we tried to collaborate you know, um, without any funds, just on uh, yes, just as as a, as a um, we're just having we're just trying to to get as much funding uh, in Italy as possible and also in Belgium, but they're also willing to to help us all the time without any project. Because who is we and uh, how do yeah. you find these interlocutors in Belgium and elsewhere? No, it, it's a like as as I said, like a, a small group of anthropologists. We are four. We were four um actually three and then uh some other person but um uh, also the most important role here were uh were, were played intercultural mediators because they in their local community they did a lot of work and um they were so inspiring for us that we said okay we will just jump and go yeah there's a question from Paul. uh Dan? You can hear me, you can take the floor. Aha, uh -huh. we should hear that. We should hear Oh, hello, good afternoon. Sorry, I, I didn't know whether or not I could speak or not because um Thank you so much for having uh, a virtual session, but the, the sound was a bit muffled, so I, I couldn't hear you, but thank you again. I listened and I have a question I'm gonna pose. I don't know if you can answer it or not. Um, it's coming more from, well, I should um, describe, um, I myself um, am a scholar activist and I'm, I situate a lot of the work that I do um, around EU, I'm sorry, around UK borders um, and UK border regimes um, where I'm based at the moment. But I think, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm kind of wondering a bit, um, there's been a lot of discussions around intercultural communications, around NGOs, around um, collective solidarity actions. But what I wanted to know uh, is from all of this, are there actually migrants themselves organizing? Um, and I think this is kind of an important question to sort of interject, given that in the UK, when you know, when you know, we, they had Windrush and the post-war um, migration boom that happened, a lot of it was, of course, to support the capital structures of British economic interests um, from the colonial regions and from the Commonwealth regions and all of that, but um these these individuals when the migrants came when people were coming over um and again i think i should just mention and and then i'm sure many of you know that they were also british subjects they were british colonial subjects but they had very liminal um uh immigration status um even while they had this uh connection to the british colonial structure uh they began to start you know their own um collective organizing actions you know for example um, you know, we, we, you know, there's you know, carnival in in you know in um, in London, for example, is an outpost of that type of organizing. Or um, a lot of the union org, um, a lot of the wildcat strikes that happened were also led by migrants, by racialized migrants. And I was wondering, I mean, I, I don't know if that's where people are at in Bosnia Herzegovina or Serbia or Croatia, for example, or even Slovenia. But, um, you know, migrants have been very active, you know, from the 1950s, 1960s and 70s onwards in the UK in trying to push press against uh, the exoneracist, um, you know, structures uh, and also policies that existed. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, whilst there are really great groups happening, I want to know where is the migrant voice? Because, you know, 
I, I, I look now in the UK and that's kind of been lost because of the rampant NGOization of migrant issues. So previously these were type grassroots organizing done within migrant communities, you know, migrant labor communities, and now it's been sort of taken away for, you know, from NGOs. And I want to know where is the situation now, at least um, in, you know, in your landscapes, are there migrants politically organizing themselves? No, I have this problem uh, every time when I'm speaking at these kinds of, of, of like um, conversations. Um, I don't see migrants as a them, a group of others. Uh, first of all, in this room, I'm sure that half of us were, are, or are coming from uh, migrant families. Uh, so all of us are migrants at some point of life. There is a very few people in the world who will not migrate from one town to another, from a village to a town, from one country to another. I mean, some of us many times, and uh, it's just people. Yeah, people do organize along the way or in the countries where they stay, where they don't. We are also organized, so it's just we should do it together. And that's about solidarity. It's like. Uh, people doing something with the people or organizing politically and talking about the same issues that we are uh, faced with uh, because the migration is a natural process that uh, all of us um, are doing at some point of our lives. So wishing or at least we should uh, accept it as something that is normal and it's part of uh, everyday life of uh, every human being. And as such, we organized um, among people. I don't know if that, that is clear. <laughs> I, I agree with you, uh, Nijara. At the same time, I think we sometimes forget, at least we in academia, more, maybe more than others, we forget that we have these privileged voices and that many times we speak for them instead of speaking with them. In a way, um, we, for example, uh, have this opportunity, as, as I explained to you with, uh, with these intercultural mediators, that we um, didn't want to uh, do a barrier between so-called refugees and so-called labor migrants. I, 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 I pro we probably know that this is a really fast, fast distinction in many respects, because it's also, uh, if you think about project and money, you can see why we still have these distinctions because usually projects, your projects are focused on asylum seekers and refugees. And ma in many occasions in Slovenia, we don't see these groups as really intertwined. So uh, we were trying to do um, together to have a group of people, of people, not of migrants, but a group of people who are Albanian speaking, Arab speaking, uh, Farsi speaking, not to see, for example, Albanian uh, speaking people as completely different and separated from our uh, activist efforts. At the same time, I think it's quite important the role, the role and the, the, the struggle of Ambassador Rock, who is uh, Embassy Rock, who is very important um, center for many people, for many different people, and also for people with migrant migrant background. And just um, some weeks ago, um, people from Burundi uh, did organize an incredibly powerful protest against uh, pushbacks uh, in Croatia because uh, many of them uh, are now expecting to be pushed back in, in uh, Croatia. So they themselves said enough and they, they were together with, with us uh, were, were uh, in front of parliament doing petitions and so on. So I think it's, it's kind it of- means, sorry, that we organize around the goals and ideas and not along yeah. the line who is migrant, who is not. So that's the idea, that's political organization, which yes. the ideas. Absolutely. It doesn't matter what our background is in that sense because we all have the same goals. That's true. Yeah, but sometimes we tend to we tend to really to forget. Uh, we tend to have uh, uh, only us tend to have the voice. Not not uh, you know. Sometimes we uh, 
are, are trying to represent uh, things or um, ideas that are, are theirs, but not together with them. So I, I know about this horrible illness we have, all of us, especially in academia, as I said. Mm -hmm. I think Sana's plaintiff again here. Um, your questions are always super sharp and make us think a lot about the ways we do things with you. Um, I appreciate your, your engagements with the critical border studies and and everything that's happening in the UK now is really concerning. Um, so you're a great um, you're a great collaborator in understanding how these different systems are also making us very complicit. Um, I do understand your question from different angles. And on one hand, I'm also taking a position that we are being in a struggle together, being uh, former refugees, former migrants, going through um, very similar struggles that uh, new migrants are, are facing with today. In Croatia, for instance, many of us have memories of um, similar struggles of living here and surviving here in the 90s, uh, given that we come from different identities and from migrant workers' communities. Um, I do think at the same time, we've gained some sense, some sense and some, some position of privilege um, um, and, and being able to build home and some sort of um, safety, which is not always, you know, 100% safety. But um, I think we, we do have to ask that question, what kind of work are we doing here and who takes part in that work? And um, um, when we were, you know, envisioning tribunal and at least four people in this room were participating in the formative um, formative processes around tribunal and the questions we had, you know, we did talk about that, who are we? And then how do we distinguish the position of, of subjects and witnesses? And in many ways, because our interrogation stems from the 90s and from the treatment in the 90s, we kind of position ourselves as, as, as subjects, but at the same time, we are witnesses to what's happening at the borders, to what's happening in the detention centers and, and whatnot. So our positions also diverge from one to another and they connect in that sense. Um, so um, I think also, you know, today we are going to discuss with the Women to Women Collective, which is a uh, which is a transnational migrant or trans migrant collective. Um, and they're gonna be showing the work of solidarity they do with uh, migrants who are dead um, and the families of the dead. Um, and this is what we're gonna see in the second part of this panel. But then also I want to remind everybody who's here and everybody on Zoom who wants to connect that tomorrow we have, we have a panel that is going to center the topic of migrant resistance and migrant organizing in Croatia, in the Balkans and Europe. And we're gonna have two or three migrants, people who identify themselves as new migrants in, in, in these Western societies who are leading the movements uh, in Europe currently and who are not either always to collaborate with activists or more particularly NGOs who seem to be, you know, putting the, the labor of um, the labor of, of freedom of movement into, into a neoliberal spectrum of projects. Um, and so I think it's important for us to understand that there are as well resistances to the way we might communicate that migration justice and migration justice world making as such. Um, yeah, that was just a... Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are any questions or comments, please uh, raise them. If not, Okay. Uh, please. Um, actually, I have a comment on this and then maybe a question for Nijara. And the comment on this, I think um, a big difference uh, between the UK situation and um, our situation here is that UK was a colonial uh, country and we have not. And uh, this uh, also means that there's a really different kind of answer to the <laughs> uh, there's a different kind of history surrounding uh, organizing surrounding uh, cr creating migrant communities uh, and um, we had a completely different kind of history uh, one with the non-alignment movement uh, uh, and the organization around that but actually a quite low number of uh, uh, racialized people, uh, excluding Roma, uh, living in Croatia specifically, but uh, also 
which I think kind of um, the comparison between the UK and uh, our countries in this sense, uh, or France or Belgium uh, uh, is, uh, I think, a little bit different. And the, the question for Nijara is, um, how do you envision or do you envision uh, at all building a movement from this people to people or one on one or this kind of human um, just spontaneous solidarity, which also recognizes something which is extremely important. And, and I see practization as something that really um, creates a structure that in a way uh, builds relation, builds, creates this power relationship that then need to be deconstructed. Uh, so, but, um, and then my question is like, how, how do you go from this one to one to building a movement? Do you go to building a movement or not? Or uh, in, so this is. I, I think it is already happening on, on, on many levels. Even, even us here sitting today is a part of like building the, the, the movement and finding the spaces uh, and new ways to articulate uh, these ideas and to act together. Uh, in the same direction and talking about what do we want and asking ourselves what solidarity is and what kind of solidarity do we want solidarity and question uh, everything. So I, I, I'm seeing like a lot, of, I see more and more these transnational uh, kind of like groups that are getting together, um, but also uh, being part of the movement means also like helping to a person who is currently in the move or in any kind of need to uh, achieve whatever his or her uh, goal is, uh, not from um, judging or not from, from um, enjoying. <laughs> I don't know how to, <laughs> to put enjoyization. I don't know how to like put that, that same word in, um, in mind. So, uh, pushing and finding a way how to articulate that in, in, in um, actions, political actions uh, on the street and recognizing the power we have. So like me being in Bosnia, uh, I do not have the same power as you being a citizen of European Union. I cannot go on the streets living in protectorate in the periphery of the EU. Nobody will listen to me. I don't know who to, to address what I have the issues and how to I kind of like say anything. But then you in Zagreb, you do have that power. Um, and you should do that. Rather than, or in Italy, rather than going to Bosnia with old shoes, you should come out in front of your house and demand political change because that's the only way. Act, uh, do whatever it is needed to change uh, the situation uh, in which we are living. Because today these guns and these, these uh, uh, police sticks and uh, the drones are following uh, people who are coming from countries outside of the European continent. Uh, but tomorrow they, they are meant for us, they're only used against us. So tomorrow we will stop their dreams, tomorrow somebody will stop our dreams, and at the end we will live in a dreamless world. So it's kind of like, um, and I really think we really need to recognize if you can do what? I really cannot do the same that you can um, as a, a, I mean, with your privileges, so to, to use it, but it is a privilege uh, to me, but I can do what I can do. So um, it is also part of the, 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 the moment that we recognize this the strength that we have in ourselves and in, uh, in the places where we are in positions that we hold. Thank you. Is Kiara still with us? Uh, maybe my last question for Kiara, uh, following yes. what Najara said, uh, and that is um, no, but she's listening to you. Uh -huh, okay. Um, uh, Kiara, did I hear you well that you said that maybe the European Parliament is the only institution that um, has some uh, sensitivity 
to the demands that are made by the people, especially following what uh, Nijara just said as an, as an advice or a proposal to citizens of the European Union, you don't necessarily need to go into the field in uh, in the Balkans, for example, in countries which are not members of the EU, but maybe there is a homework in your own countries in demanding political change. Is this, uh, is any European institutions going to listen or is the European Parliament maybe the, the best address for this? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So what emerged from the research is that uh, the European Parliament is perceived as the only European institution accountable to citizens. Actually, it is the only one that is voted by European citizens. And also, uh, it was the case in Italy uh, with the, in the case of the 2020 movements in support of people on the move, that some of grassroots groups were able to uh, have the support of members of the European Parliament who were also uh, along the route. They were both also criticized for this, but also appreciated from this, for this. So I would say there are, um, and of course, there are, those are the members of the Parliament that are sensitive to the issue. But what also we noticed is that uh, it seems not, they don't seem to be able to create a strong block of uh, um, members of parliament uh, uh, at the um, beyond Italy, so to say, at least uh, they, I mean, the Italian members of parliament support the Italian groups. So once again, it seemed that from the grassroots, there is more ability to create transnational uh, support to act in solidarity with people on the move. And it is more difficult at the level of the institutions, even when they, I mean, even if we are talking about the most accountable institution, European institution to civil society. Uh, so this is an, another interesting aspect that uh, it would be worth investigating further. Yes, definitely, especially in the year prior to the European elections, which unfortunately yeah. I expected to be to end up in with more conservative populist votes. So the, the demand for political action should be even stronger. Okay, so we will start since we are already late for half an hour. Or... Okay, uh, hello. Yes, maybe. Okay. We, we are proud to approach the second part of our panel today, where we are going to be talking to Mariana Tamesha, Selma Banic, uh, Josef Lumic. And potentially other um, members of the Women to Women Collective. If they find the right track. If they find the right track. It looks like there is a local traffic collapse today in Zagreb with the tram not working. And so many people that when we wait here really got stuck. 
Um, yeah, so we're hoping that some of them are going to manage and come, but nevertheless, we're going to give the floor to um, three activists, researchers, artists who have been engaged in the labor of documenting and honoring migrants' death and working closely to, um, to their families. Thank you, thank you, Amina. Thank you all for having us here, for inviting us to uh, speak uh, about things we do and things about which we think. The structure of this second part will be uh, as follows. I will give just some short opening remarks about border deaths and solidarities with the focus on the context of the Balkan migratory trade, uh, meaning Croatia and neighboring countries of so Slovenia, Bosnia. Uh, Serbia, uh, etc. And after that, we will uh, start a dialogue between us, dialogue that started a long time before, what? in which my voice really. needs to be up. Louder. Okay, I will try to speak up. And in this dialogue, uh, beside me, uh, Josipa Lulic will participate also, uh, maybe uh, Simane, if she managed to come, and Selma, Selma also. Safa sends her greetings and uh, apologize for not being able to, to be with us. So uh, just shortly, we will speak, as I said, about border deaths and solidarity and plurality. And uh, I know that here there's no need maybe to speak a lot about our, a lot of our border deaths, but nevertheless, I will just repeat what Tamara last, uh, how she summarizes different definitions of border death. The narrowest definition would be that these are deaths that happen on the border crossing, so in transit. But a wide definition would be that these are all deaths that are somehow tied uh, to any manifestation of state uh, made boundaries in any space. So in the broader sense, border deaths or migrant deaths, or however we call them, could be defined as premature deaths of persons whose movement or presence has been unauthorized and irregularized, so made somehow non-acceptable non as they navigate and interact in, with state made boundaries. Border deaths are results of EU and member state border policies. And here there's been a lot of talk about solidarity as a foundation principle of European Union. And indeed in treaties and, treaties and in different documents, solidarity stands out as a, some sort of um, connector of all different interests in European Union. But today maybe uh, in this, uh, decades of securitization and criminalization of migration, we could speak about militarized solidarity in respect to, to migration, meaning solidarity that is put in action in service of ordering, demarcation, differentiation, militarization. This is a solidarity which is fueled by racism and labor segmentation. Border deaths are integrated uh, in border control. I, I think uh, many many authors and many of us would agree that they are not side effects, they are elements of border, border control, unfortunately, and because of that, we could speak also of that for solidarity of the European Union. In global, global in terms, border deaths are results of systematic occlusion or lack deficit of uh, solidarity. They are a result of bordering or European Union bordering or visa regime, which in practice denies the entrance to the most population of Asia and uh, Africa. Uh, what can be said about border debt? Uh, a, lot of, lot of, a lot of could be said, but maybe here it would be important just to underline, underline that illegalization that follows, please go back, that, that follows lives of people on the move is follow them also in, in that. Many disappeared, many unknown, many are invisible, thank you. There is also no functional system, not in Balkan migratory trade, but nowhere, maybe in some microspaces of identification and uh, sort of uh, identification, let's, let's say it like that. Uh, because of that, a um, lot of, uh, mm, Things connected to the border that are connected and depend on the individuals, different individuals from activists to journalists, researchers, different public officers, etc. Uh, identification depends on their uh, knowledge, their interest, and their solidarities in, 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 in the end. Mm. Many of individuals try to somehow uh, bridge the back gap between 
uh, on the one hand, institutions that are incapable to, to uh, register and deal with border deaths and the families on the other side. Here are uh, many of individuals who are present here have been involved in all these practices I mentioned, I was mentioning, but very briefly that in the context, please go back. In the context, we are referring here uh, several mm, different networks and tools uh, for identification and documentation were developed. And one of uh, them is the face group that and missing in, in Balkans. This is a group of, about which we can uh, talk uh, uh, in the discussion much more. There are groups like this exist in different parts of the world, but this is as far as I know specific because it is uh, broad, it lasts four years, and it is connecting people, uh, people who, who mm, are looking for uh, for truth and for the justice. Uh, it is a private group, but it is uh, open in a way to anyone who, who can contribute, as far as I know. And this is a valuable source for families, friends, and activists. Uh, please, next slide. The second tool I would like to share with you is the database of uh, border deaths related to the Balkan migratory trail. It is published recently, a year ago maybe. It's uh, available online on the uh, website, uh, which is, which you can find here. It's a sort of counter uh, statistic practice or statistical activism. It is, its goal is to connect and um, share information, but as far as I know for now, it also served for a sort of um, different practices, including commemoration. Please, next slide, where you can see the, the list, how it looks like. So the, traditionally, the solidarity with deceased is, uh, is expressed as a support to families and uh, as a care for a dead body top in terms of taking care of funeral or a grave. Setting aside many unmarked graves, invisible and marginalized that, that we witnessed uh, during our, our visits to uh, cemeteries and graveyards, here I would like to show you a sort of examples of vernacular or everyday solidarity that Mujara was somehow mentioning, mentioning before related to, to deaths here specifically. Um, here you can see uh, on the first photo, you can see a candle slept on a grave of an unknown person in a cemetery in Bonavas in Chitnoma in Slovenia. And this candle is a trace of someone being present there giving uh, respect to the, uh, that person. The other, the other uh, photo is showing a memorial built by uh, a local activist uh, in the memory of a uh, deceased person. And please next. Beside as memorials or candles, the respect is paid by uh, also um, making a memorial, as you can see on the on your, it's your left picture, on grave of Madina Cusini, which is uh, uh, which has a plaque uh, on it, and also on the left side there is a grave of uh, Madina Bibi, also a young girl who, who died in, in Serbia. Uh, which and her grave is decorated with uh, with the toys. So uh, respect is uh, shown and expressed by building a mon monument or by different sign. Uh, and on this last uh, photos, I would like to share with you from the everyday or vernacular solidarities. These are photos of uh, graves that are made by locals themselves. They are handmade. One is uh, in Lipa, close to, close to Zagreb, and uh, it's a grave, it's a gravel and a wooden plaque with the name of the deceased Ahmed Ibrahim Falti. And the other is a grave in uh, Otok in Slavonia, in Croatia, where uh, a local uh, who, who works in a criminal company uh, planted uh, flowers and watered it. Uh, it is connected to a local tradition how to how to treat a uh, grave who has not its relatives, its its visitors. So by concluding the, this this introduction with the pictures of vernacular solidarity, I would like to introduce us all to the discussion about grassroots, maybe not vernacular, but in terms also vernacular 
in general said we are all migrants we all participate and we are part of uh, of this um, I would like to open a dialogue about the passage the passage is a text and memorial created by by Sema Vanich and uh, done in work with the uh, collective women to women to which I Selma Josipa and Saman of course and Corey participate uh, we wanted to uh, use this opportunity to uh, discuss in public uh, about what is the passage what does it mean to us and do we need passages or something else so I'm opening uh, the dialogue and we will you all can see what is the passage but maybe Selma can make creator and, and author and artist can tell us what is the passage um yeah so uh thank you very much uh, I would like to first, uh, yeah, take a talk. I just, I would like to say hi to everyone. And uh, maybe just before talking about the passage, I'm thinking constantly what, uh, what solidarity is for me. Um, I would say it's a lived experience. Oh, <laughs> Um, yes, so saying that um, as being a uh, my whole life a freelance artist and uh, yeah, activist, whatever that means, or even like post activist, um, uh, I would say that I'm constantly challenging myself and questioning what, what does solidarity mean to me? And what does it mean and how it's embedded in my life, in, in my community, um, in this current moment? Uh, it is a, a lived experience and um, I try to challenge it uh, with questioning, uh, yeah, it's just basically questioning, uh, what resources, what powers, what privileges I have, uh, and how they can be uh, redistributed, right? Um, I mean, all of us in this room don't, I mean, we don't, we are not, we, we don't, we do not, we are together in the same space, but we come really from different uh, backgrounds and uh, have uh, different resources, have different uh, powers and privileges. So, um, yeah, for me, like as an artist, that is a freelancer without a um, um, permanent engagement, um, that also needs to be kind of um, said. On the line of that, um, the passage uh, I think came, Mariana, when you um, invited me to go to this grace, which when I'm watching these photos, I'm, I feel so much anxiety still um and i think because of that anxiety that is it was, it's felt now but it, it was also felt when we uh, started to visit uh, graves um uh, i think from that need to speak up and not to speak up only from a position of a researcher or an artist but as a member of community that wants to condemn practice of uh european um regime of death um we kind of decided, I think, at the graveyard that we want to make, uh, that we want to address this, this big question, but also a lot of questions that come together um, while being there and understanding that those graves uh, are completely, or th those people that are um, uh, that are in, the, in, in those rakas uh, and, and their stories are completely detextualized, right? And uh, meaning that for local communities, uh, there is no sign who they are, how did they die, what happened, who caused it, uh, and so on. Um, but also, um, we understood that we want to make it uh, as a, a collective um, act or a collective practice that is both artistic or that is using arts or uh, artistic tools um, as tools for speaking our truths or, or tools for social change, but also to uh, try to um, uh, invite political storytelling. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the, um, the experiences, lived experiences of uh, different women from the Women to Women Collective 
come um, um, made perfect sense, right? Um, and um, in the same time, um, the idea that our, at least my, but I, I know also yours, uh, anxiety uh, had to be uh, brought on the level of communal, of, of a practice that can be shared with others. That is a public statement about condemning uh, those policies, both Croatian and EU. Uh, and that we make this uh, practice of, of grieving, right, uh, uh, a, co a collective public uh, uh, act, right, a public practice. And uh, yeah, I think this is, um, at the end, uh, we made this memorial, a collective of how many, maybe 20, 20 women, um, that, um, yeah, some of them, um, and Samane can speak about that for sure, uh, made this trail themselves, meaning the, the migrant trail uh, going through the Balkans. Some had uh, previous, previous, previous experiences of, of, uh, um, of different types of erasure, right? And uh, I think now it serves as a kind of foot in the door, uh, so as an artistic or, yeah, um, um, commemorative, uh, even the colonial monument as something that is a foot in the door to speak about uh, what is happening, to speak about our experiences, to speak about public practices, to speak about um, what solidarity means and how it can be practiced. Yeah, I think I would stop here. Stop here yeah, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you just uh, think uh, your people are translating okay. to Samana. Samana, do you prefer cooperation? Mm -hmm. Okay, I will just say then in English and Croatian and go back because the to Google. Okay, cool. So the Samana Rani, uh, who is a member of a women, women collective and she's also running the Hair Salon, is uh, here here with us. She participated in make go passage. Samana uh Lamita. Kolektiva žene ženama i vodi vlastiti prijateljski salonjec s nama tu i sudjelovala je u izradi prijelaza. Selma already mentioned the question of who is what pointed over Samana and the question what do you feel or think about the passage? Selma je već uvela to pitanje prema Samane, a pitanje glasi što misliš ili posjećaš vezano uz prijelaz. Ja ne mogu govoriti u dobro uvišja. Uh, I can speak English that well, so but also don't speak Croatian that well, but I will try to say something. Uh, uh, when I was uh, <laughs> when I was um, uh, doing the embroidery of the face of uh, a man who died, uh, it was really hard for me. Because I also crossed the river two times, but they pushed me back to Bosnia. And I've seen many uh, boys and men crossing the river without a boat, just uh, trying to swim to cross the river to Croatia. Sometimes I would uh, stay and wait for uh, to my way to go and then I would see a group leaving of, of five people and only three people returning and uh, I wouldn't know what happened to the other two people they they they, they were not traced to them uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, three, uh, uh, 
Um, so I have uh, also two children. I have uh, uh, twins, uh, girls and a son. And uh, there were also other children in other groups. So when we are in the river, everyone is focusing on the small children to, to save the small children. And so my twin, uh, twins, uh, three and a half years ago, so did uh, this, and it was really stressful. I was holding the twins, and my son, who was older, was holding uh, another child who, who was one year old. Because the, the mother of the child um, who had a low pressure, and uh, under this kind of stress, she wasn't able to take care of the kid. Uh, the boat um, was uh, also shaking because uh, the, the river was overflown with rain uh, and it was not a good boat, so it was uh, shaking a little bit. So when I was doing this project and doing the embroidery of the face of one of the people who died in this river, I was thinking this could have been my face. Um, if I understood you correctly, um, uh, it is the uh, now like uh, when the situation like that happens, uh, I also put things on Facebook and I, uh, uh, I put some music to commemorate uh, uh, the memory of people who died and, uh, and trying to talk about how uh, there should be uh, help and uh, Google Translate works. And um, uh, she said, I'm happy to be uh, uh, the voice of the people who died. Mm. And um, when I was doing this, I was crying a lot because also when you see it, uh, it became, becomes more real, you understand it uh, better. And I'm thinking those people, they also have families, they have mothers, sisters. It is really difficult. <laughs> and when I do see a river again, a lot of times I get stressed all over again. And uh, uh, when Selma was with me, and so then she would hug me and say, it's okay, it's okay, calm down. <laughs> because um, I still get stressed when I meet the river. <laughs> it is hard to see, uh, even after I saw a lot of uh, water, it's still quite stressful. <laughs> When I when I go to the seaside, I only step uh, I just stay in the... just a few steps or sit on the shore because water is too stressful. Yeah. Maybe just mm -hmm. a technical uh, also thing. Uh, so it's thirty six portrait that are symbolic, of course, number because we all know that the numbers are high and getting higher, and it looks like I don't know what what can still be done to stop uh, uh, water deaths. Um, and then for some people, we had uh, their, their, we had photos 
and for some we didn't. So uh, artists in a Europe uh, try to imagine how portraits, how those people could be look could could look like, right? Um, so we had to also kind of negotiate uh, that as well. Uh, having information about some people, having less information about others, having almost none uh, uh, on, on, on some others. So it, it is a representation. Of course, it's, it's um, maybe we chose, we each chose personally uh, ones we wanted to work with. And I think maybe if those were aligned maybe with, with what we could, uh, uh, what resonated with us in, in, in a way. And also, of course, that we had, uh, you know, people who, who died uh, not because of rivers, not because of lakes, not because of seas, not because of mountains, not because of forests, but because of um, politics and, and uh, EU politics and, and uh, borders, of course, and police brutality and uh, colonialism and uh, racism and capitalism that are all, of course, intertwined, right? And then uh, also uh, uh, one other uh, technical thing, and maybe then also I can also share, uh, mm -hmm. so I can maybe translate then some on it, um, is that uh, the, the, the memorial was printed botanically because of that, right? To kind of say, okay, these are not accidents. You know, it's not nature that takes life, it's, it's other people, right? It's, it's the regime that uh, takes um takes the life right and um and last thing uh on that line is um that now since we made it in 2021 we are in contact and communication with uh, many families and communities of the deceased and of course that makes even more sense it's not only you know of us of, about our collective uh grieving and and uh, Stating, uh, you know, that we, that, uh, you know, we remember, we, we see, we remember, maybe we cannot stop that, but we see and we remember, and we can and are there also for the families and communities of the, of the deceased and uh, several people after the mon monument was um, um, presented in 2021 were repatriated. Uh, so, so it, it also, it, it it served as, as a way, as a kind of um, uh, a, a thread, right, connecting uh, different uh, stories and, and different lived experiences and uh, and living together. Beyond that, you could imagine while we were actually yeah. maybe um, visiting graves for the first time. It somehow, somehow included all of us and also directed people towards us to, to keep to be to be here. so someone is speaking about her memory meeting the young man uh, who uh, was attempting to cross the river and uh, before doing that right he left all of his possessions his uh, uh, documents some money he had some food he had uh, at, uh, at the coast right at the, uh, at the bank at the river bank and then someone asked but why are you doing this? And the, the, the boy, the, the young man uh, answered, I don't know if I will if I will survive. If my attempt crossing, uh, what, what will this be the result of my, my crossing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I hope and I 
struggle for that as well. Also, I think through this memorial, that there will be safe passage for people, um, and that we need need safe that passage for people because all of the people that have died and are dying maybe in this moment uh, uh, have families, have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, communities that are waiting for some news. Yeah, I had a family for my group on Rona, but they will be shown in Nemoch, Alina, not in me, but see. Yes. And uh, somebody sharing uh, an experience uh, of, of, a, of a person who now is in Germany, but he never learned what happened to his son. And I think this is a reality for hundreds, thousands of people that are searching for, for their loved ones on many social networks, as you showed uh, the groups, uh, different groups on social media, but also in, in most in their communities, right? That we know maybe 5% of that, 10% are five. Father, 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 I will get, I don't have a question. Please give me a question. I have a question, I think, uh, not only because we are running out of time, but because everything is said. Yeah. What, what needs to be done, Samana already said. Uh, but Josipa, uh, Josipa is educator and a performer, or she is connecting life like this, or how to present you. She's also an uh, art historian. And maybe, maybe you have something to add. You participated in making the message, and you're very active in giving the And I was thinking about, um, I mean, I, I, I am an historian by trade, and um, uh, this was my um, former life. And I was thinking whether to approach the question about what the memorial um, is from um, art historical perspective or um, or from the theater of the press perspective where I actually work with which I worked for years which I've worked with uh, for years and I'm still working now and uh, I don't think the history of art has a lot to say about it because uh, the most the, the the way the history of art is taught at universities where how I was teaching it and how I was uh, uh, learning it. It was really um, our uh, practices of a privileged minority. And um, what happened with the passage is uh, something that I believe that Augusto Wall would call the, the aesthetics of the oppressed, the art that is coming from below, the art that says, I, like all of us, have a right to expression, we have right to art, we have right to find a way to talk about uh, our lived experiences through art. And this is art, uh, not, um, uh, I mean, it, it, this is art because, because of that, not, um, uh, um, not supposed to that, not, uh, not opposed to that, not that it's, so I feel that um, the process of, of uh, working on the passage that was uh, actually several months long uh, was artistic process, it was political process, it was a uh, healing process, it was a community building process, and it was, um, uh, yeah, in this sense, I think, extremely important. And thank you to of you for uh, bringing us into this space and allowing us to go through it. Thank you for me. For me, it was empowering and enriching to uh, have a channel to come and deliver this experience with outside, and not only to deliver, but be empowered in, in the process. This is what happened. I think yes. this is the strongest thing. Yes, also for me, I think sometimes when, when we have, you have to you have to acknowledge that you can't. Mm -hmm. And with this stuck position, I think, with this position of not being able, you are able to grieve, you are able to express, you are able to mobilize, you know, whatever political imagination is left, whatever political power, you know, uh, is there and to gain more. I think for me, I completely resonate. And I think, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, you all can join or comment now if you have something to add or consider the bridge or the issue as you do. And here you can take the print of the passage. Um, yeah. It was made to follow up and give a verbal or out. And maybe also show the okay. camera. Uh, yes, I think the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Well, make make sure that this is um, shot on the and on the back web. side. Uh, this is the the print variant of the text type, and on the back side is sort of reading, not instructions but suggestions about how it is made and about people whose portraits are on the on the passage. Uh, you can download it. Download it. Yes, but Let's I think see. also maybe we can show a little bit about the how is it connected to the future just about so he published a uh, glossary because five uh -huh. uh, keywords or i think it doesn't make it too complicated thank you so many things are growing out of the passage for all of us i was also thinking when you were speaking about uh, solidarity and everyday solidarity about some other work that came after the work on the passage so your movement or about the commemoration every year commemoration of the Hussini yeah. that or the Graphic novel, novel made by Anna Euro yeah. of Medina, some other many, many, many different examples of solidarity in the uh, world that are around us that somehow connected to the passage. I think the passage stands in the middle for me, at least. Everything is like coming inside and drop. Yeah, okay. yeah. okay. yeah. But credits, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can now uh, open the floor to the others if there is need of space or if not, just to thank you. Yes, of course. How would you like it? Yeah, come here, come here. How would you following louder? How is it following? How did you get tired of the more cloud? Um, I was just wondering uh, how did you decide to present people in um, this particular way, in the sense that it's a portrait, people are looking forward, they are faced like they are faced. To somebody who is looking at them yeah. at the camera or at the person passing by, they're posing. Yeah. It has a sense of posing. Um, we are all constructed from these different kinds of movements, us being in the space in very particular ways, not only a movement which is um, crossing, but a movement um, like the way we sit, the way we interact with each other. And I suppose that you face the challenge to like portray these movements uh, in the facial expressions in different kinds of ways. Did you think about it? Did you think about why yeah. this is? I, 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 know. I, if I understand yes, your sir. question, yeah. Uh, of course, there is always the question of representation because we are working with representation. We're not working with life, right? So we still live life. We're working with somebody who is gone. So, uh, in, in that sense, we wanted to commemorate the, the lives that we lost, right? And making a portrait, especially in these very precarious conditions when you don't have uh, much information. Most of the times, you don't even you don't know how the person looked like or uh, how how it perceived, what it meant, you know, uh, how it was relating to everything in life. Uh, we decided to, to go with this very simplistic uh, um, uh, uh, portraits, but on the other hand, the whole memorial is seen from both sides. So actually the back side is equally important to the front side and the back side actually shows the labor of love, the political labor of the community that made this uh, memorial. And in that sense, it's full of movement, it's full of, uh, uh, in their uh, in, in full of relations, full of uh, intertwined with, uh, yeah, uh, not only our labor, uh, labor, but also uh, you know the movement of needle and the thread and the uh, platinum, the, mm -hmm. the textile, right? So, um, yeah, and and of course the the bot botanical print is the one also representing in a way because. It, we collected all of the botanical uh, um, items and uh, only the ones that were left with autumn. So we didn't want to, you know, steal life, but we wanted to kind of uh, press that botanical into the 
uh, into the textile in a way that you know it's supportive to the people that you're commemorating. So it's not taking lives, right? It's it's supporting <coughs> um, this commemorative or anti-commemorative in a way. And if I may add, I think it is also important that we uh, basically we don't know the persons that are on these portraits, so they are looking to foreigners. And this is how it, it looks when you take a represent yourself to foreigners. But nevertheless, you can feel a strong attachment. That I think through the passage, through this kind of like I remember uh, uh, one friend. She uh, she actually she was very emotional when when she saw uh, this person. This person because we had your uh, like the camera is there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, because it reminded of of uh, the fact that he had uh, headphones, right? Mm -hmm. It remind and he died in Yeliska district. Like, it reminded her of the place yes. where she and her mm -hmm. friends often went to uh, concerts. So it had completely different change of of the context of 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 this of that place, its final resting place, right? So I was wondering how much as a personal stuff that I found different kinds of information were like uh, informing when some, some when there were information they were informing the representation. Yes. That's right. There, there was a question. Yeah. Yes, we have a following question for this uh, for this part of the conversation. Um uh, now we're called I don't know, sorry, I don't know what to put up uh, to that, you know, curious for the audience where their artwork is, where is it displayed? The artworks need to be a lot about the process of making. Does it have value uh, when it's shown and who does that part of the conversation? Okay, okay. Well, uh, what's your name? Well, will you tell more about the mobile textile hypothesis traveling you know, and being exposed in different? Um, maybe just to um, actually read what Samana because it, um, uh, what Samana said mm -hmm. um, is um, I think quite important. She was just writing it. Um, it was that we wanted to have a, a lasting effect, and um, uh, we 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 gathered and showed it, and we hope that as many people are able to see it, so they can meet the people who lost their lives. And uh, uh, so I think uh, this is the answer to, um, or answer, or, or attempted answer to, uh, do we want to uh, show it as an artifact? And I think that uh, we definitely do. And, um, but the process I think is, uh, it can't be really taken away because the, uh, the the art piece itself is about the process as much as of the final product, and uh, this is something that is reflected in the way that it is presented as well um, in its curatorial um, perspective. So it is never uh, just the the memorial plot alone. Uh, it is always connected. To uh, videos of the process, to stories, uh, to the uh, political storytelling that was done, so um, which are integral part of uh, uh, the place. So all of us who participated in creating um, creating the uh, the portraits or embroidering the pro portraits had also told our personal stories connected um, uh, to this. And to fact, does it open a uh, discussion? Uh, my experience is definitely that it does. Um, for example, the last um, presentation we had, uh, or the last exhibition of, uh, that uh, uh, we had that I was present for, was in the ECA, just mm -hmm. uh, I a couple of months, a couple of months, yeah. couple of months ago. Um, where we um, actually um, connected it to a big discussion that lasted for some time because we started um, be, um, at, uh, at the close for the closing of the exhibition. We uh, invited uh, people uh, for um, um, a workshop that was about uh, also creating um, a plastic uh, pads, sleeping pads for people on the move. That, uh, but 
also as a way of talking about those stories of, of, of those passages of those people who uh, hopefully will not be part of uh, some memorial later that were uh, in, in Rijeka uh, at the time. And um, so this kind of conversation definitely happened in a really large group. And uh, it was started by, by the memorial. So I feel that um, because of the way it is curated in when it is presented, uh, which also means the, um, the brochure, the videos and the uh, uh, other things around it. Um, it does not exist without the process. And this is, I think, something uh, that is uh, maybe going back to your question about the artistic work, um, uh, I think is quite important uh, to see and understand. And it is quite transformative uh in as an artistic practice that incorporates uh that incorporates the 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 process in such an integral way yeah i think uh, yeah i think there's yeah. the time for yeah. yeah thank you thank you so, thank, you, thank you very much thank you mina <laughs> thank you mina i think i have a couple of words to wrap up our discussion which of course touched upon very many different important topics and so be kind with me because of my difficult role uh, I won't be able to to give relevance to all I've listened to but of course I will think over everything that has been said uh, carefully indeed we are discussing here about transnationality when migration is per se a transnational phenomenon but solidarity in a transnational context is a different kind of transnationality, it's a different kind of solidarity. It has different challenges than within a, a nation state, with your own neighbor, with someone cross by, mm, because we because of the borders that, uh, that uh, are there and that uh, impede migration and that um, those that show solidarity would like to um, overcome. But, um, these barriers are very many and not only the ones that states uh, put in, into place. And I think as uh, solidarians uh, in general, there is a need for deep reflection on um, those barriers and, and those the specific context of being a solidarian in a transnational context. Um, somehow we discussed, uh, it was it emerged uh, right at the very end, the importance it has for many of us to empower ourselves. Um, uh, to create alliances because we assist uh, to political phenomena that uh, we consider uh, um, uh, unacceptable that we would like to overcome. Um, but uh, uh, it is supposed to empower other actors too. Um, but there are uh, many, uh, so we, we can consider ourselves allies to those actors uh, that are to the migrants. Allies uh, like um, uh, 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 Spanish scholars um, would define uh, solidarity inside the country, privileged allies. Uh, Santos uh, discusses about this uh, internally and while listening to him, I realized how much um, additional elements that were there in addition to the reason why we mobilize the transnationally, which is generally a question you have to ask yourself whenever you mobilize. Um, uh, but uh, because you are an ally, because this is not directly impacting on you, or in general, you are you are in a different position than the sub subject you are um, uh, creating an ally with. But um, uh, you don't want to empower only yourself, but you want to empower the other. And indeed, uh, solidarity is a, a possibility for empowerment of um, others. Um, but it could also disempower. Um, so we should always be aware of the uh, responsibility we take. And I have myself uh, collected a number of examples where um, actors, they were fundamental, for instance, in, in strategic litigation at international level, transnational level, um, to uh, fight against pushbacks. 
uh, the, the, the point uh, one the, they they as the person that was involved in litigation wanted to withdraw because uh, his life was uh, traumatized in the middle of this legal process. But but not only that, I know about film uh, uh, documentary activists that uh, uh, one did, did fantastic works on trying to make the voice of uh, migrants heard with their art artistic and cultural work. But then they had interlocutors that wanted to withdraw. They didn't want any longer to be in the public sphere. So I think a reasoning about empowerment and disempowerment in care relation is very important. Um, uh, but then, of course, there are linguistic and cultural barriers. And this is why it is very important to reflect on uh, uh, this non-bridge or, or this uh, punch ball um, role that some um, take up as, as a very important aspect. And, and clearly, even now, we've seen uh, with uh, Samanit how important it was that she was able to manage uh, Croatian, Serbo -Croatian, well, Croatian language. And, um, uh, uh, but still needed uh, uh, further mediation for the international uh, audience. Um, but let we needed it. But uh, we needed, we it, needed it. Not, not she. No, well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Well, we, but she wanted also to be listened to, so we both needed it. Let's say. Um, uh, let's say so. Somehow. Um, framing international uh, uh, in, uh, transnational uh, initiatives is. Uh, important um, uh, in reflecting upon it because then we anyway have we want and have to deal with the, import, the uh, with the international public. We want our cause to uh, to become a, a wider cause. We don't want to remain marginalized. And when on on the opposite, we've been um, forced uh, by the wave of criminalization of solidarity to be less and less visible and less and less. Um, powerful uh, in many many contexts because of um, uh, the loss of uh, public opinion, contact with public opinion that um, the criminalization produced. Um, so somehow, um, look, thinking about uh, our framing of our work, uh, the motivation that moves us, but also uh, the impact that we can have, then indeed we have to consider um, the importance of um, the relationship with larger public opinion and the media um, to start with, um, because large mainstream media are indeed a, a, a necessary interlocutor if we want our causes to emerge. But of course, it's a very difficult relationship um, that, that we all know how problematic it is. Um, and in, again, in, in transnational context, it, it's even more difficult than in the national one um, because of, again, linguistic barriers that uh, are part of the European Union political space where the plurality, the, the advantage of plurality of languages creates disadvantages in creating public discussions. Um, to conclude, I think um, uh, uh, we should um, reflect as well uh, a lot on how much uh, and how important uh, we want for, for civil society, for solidarians, for grassroots initiatives uh, to have a political role in international relations. So basically, we are trying to raise voices uh, of those that are not listened to. Um, we want to, to change things. So somehow we want to have a role in international relations. And uh, this is indeed a very, very uh, particularly difficult challenge for civil society that is always very uh, much weaker than politics um, in, in general and even more so and in the international sphere. But I think we go home with a lot of new uh, and important insights um, on, on um, on what we have listened that we all will process in our own specific way. I think you were not happy about something I said. Yes, I'm okay. sorry about um, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Okay, but but did, did you want to add something to, to conclude? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tada imam kuća, najem i režije, imam za salon, najem režije prostore država, nisam fokusirana. Moraš pomać mene, onda fokus, onda jezik. Čitan je prviš jezik, ali nikad nije fokus za ovo je, za ovo je, za ovo je. Ne znam, vezano s meni, ne, ali ja ko sam gužba, meni je da je ovaj gužba prvi, 
So yes, absolutely. Learning language is extremely important. Um, but I live in a situation where I have three children. I'm a single mother. I have to work and I have no idea if I'm going to be able to survive this month, if I'm going to be able to uh, to, to pay uh, my rent and uh, in this uh, kind of situation to have focus and actually learning language and uh, in order to be able to uh, do these things is uh, uh, something that I don't have uh, uh, the privilege to do because I'm focusing on so many other things I'm completely always in in, in uh, stress and uh, afraid um, uh, about uh, the existential things. So learning language is important, but uh, uh, I need to solve some things in, in order to be able to focus on doing that. Okay. <laughs> Ali mam iskustva da vas ste godine. Pa dolazim do teža okazanja samo škola, samo škola, igra škola. Ok, ako igram škola koji je za hranu, za deca, za kuća, za... Ja mislim da ako je teško. So maybe this is a, a, like a nice final remark uh, just to translate what Samana said uh, as well, uh, that, um, yeah, maybe I, we, we got two years of support from the state once we got the asylum, but uh, uh, after that, uh, I couldn't even get recognized um, uh, as the hairdresser. I have 20 years of experience in Iran, but because uh, there is no school for hairdressing in Iran, here I'm not recognized as a hairdresser. And um, so I think, uh, go, going back as well to the lived experience of, and, solidarity. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and solidarity and what does it mean is a nice uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> You want to no, it's just, it's just that she uh, uh, doesn't want to be negative. She's a really positive person, and I really like. And uh, I, I want to be, like that everything will be positive, and I believe everything will be okay in the end. Just step by step, I'm a positive woman. But yes, I know language is quite important. Thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. but it's good to also take the responsibility of knowing more languages uh, of our interlocutors, uh, because. But I think this was a comment for all of us. Yes. I really yeah. feel that yes. you know a very important intervention for the whole space yeah. for every everyone in this room. Kvala sam ne osjećam ovo kao kao intervenciju cijelo izbrzo sorry tim na nama tu. Hvala lijepo. Thank you so much. Then. <laughs>